Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. Grendel. By John Gardner. Using the voice of Beowulf's monster Grendel, American novelist John Gardner published his compelling tale in 1971. Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein both include monsters that are both alone and questioning their own nature. Monsters were used by these authors to make their readers re-examine their own humanity. During the twelve-year struggle with the Danes, Grendel launches war on them. While he has the ability to kill them, they are unable to kill him. In spite of this, the bards of their land exploit his cruelty as a source of inspiration for their stories. They can use it as a means to demonstrate their courage. With his mother, Grendel is a bear-like monster who dwells on the edge of society. Beowulf's slaying of her and Beowulf appears less heroic than the poem did since she is a nasty creature who has forgotten how to speak and is pitiful. While still a child, Grendel stumbles onto a lake full of fire snakes and swims through it to reach the land of men. He's fascinated by their transformation from nomadic people to a feudal society complete with roads and laws. As in earlier tales concerning the displaced monsters, he observes but never interferes, but when he does, it's terrible. He watches but never interferes. We learn that Grendel is a direct descendant of Cain, Adam's son who was exiled after slaying his brother Abel. God pronounced a curse on him and his descendants. As a result, he has a predisposition for aggression. For being a kind person, Hrothgar the Danes king is an adversary to him. However, Gardner makes the reader doubt the black and white distinction between good and evil. Before Beowulf arrives to free Grendel from the enchantment, the dragon uses a spell to make him invulnerable. Grenet is left to die alone when Beowulf pulls his limb off with superhuman strength. As the story unfolds, we first see Grendel in the depths of his crypt. He is observing the ram, who is happily grazing on a hillside. In an effort to encourage the ram to depart, Grendel throws rocks at it, but the ram continues to ignore him. The ram is a sign that spring has finally arrived for the monster. With the onset of spring, Grendel marks the twelfth year of his conflict with the human population. Grendel persists despite the futility of the conflict. Grendel is enraged by the ram's insatiable sexual appetite. Grendel recognizes that he, too, is a creature of the animal kingdom. As a monster who exudes the stench of death, he despises himself. In his realm, Grendel sees more signs of spring as he strolls through the woods. In addition, he points out the locations where the most brutal acts of violence occurred. He carries his mother's body by her side. She's swollen and foul-smelling, and she hasn't spoken in months. She has stopped communicating because she is ashamed of something that happened. The only time Grendel is able to get answers from her is when he asks about the nature of their existence. Grendel launches his yearly assault on humanity as a result of the rising temperatures. Krothgar's Mead Hall welcomes him. They turn out the lights in an attempt to scare him away, but he can see in the darkness. Grendel goes on a rampage, gleefully slaughtering anybody who stands in his way. A bag of dead bodies is then filled with him, and he takes them to the woods where he eats them. The sour meat he ate from humans gives him a stomachache in the morning. And his joy has faded into sadness, as well. While the humans are busy repairing their meat hall, Grendel sits and listens as they discuss the attack. They attribute it to an enraged god. Later, he sees human beings erect a funeral pyre. He is moved. Humans are putting rings, swords, and helmets on the bodies as they burn. They sing songs that are designed to guide the dead to Valhalla, but Grendel finds them a triumph. He flees in rage, his stomach still unsettled from his dinner, and returns to his apartment. Chapter 2 begins with Grendel's first encounter with a human being. His underground hideout was his playground as a child, where he would play blissfully for hours on end. Grendel is a lonesome wanderer who has no acquaintances. In addition to his mother, he's accompanied by a slew of terrifying monsters who stare at him silently. Grendel stumbles onto a puddle filled with flaming snakes while on the prowl. Because he senses something is being protected by the snakes, he chooses to investigate further. Grendel jumps into the sea and emerges from the shadows for the first time in the moonlight. During the first night, Grendel doesn't leave the lake, nevertheless, as time goes on, he becomes more and more adventurous. Grendel's explorations broaden his perspective on the world around him. The other creatures in his environment may be keeping an eye on him, but they never actually see him. Only his mother has ever seen him in person. It may be because they are a single creature, Grendel believes. During a day of exploration, Grendel becomes caught in a tree and cannot get out. But his mother doesn't hear him when he calls for her. The bull, on the other hand, isn't happy about it and begins to lash out. 
Grendel shifts his weight to prevent the bull from kicking him in the shin. The bull, like everyone else, moves with a blind inclination for violence as a result of Grendel's belief. Grendel is convinced that he is the center of the universe, and that everything is gravitating toward him. Grendel continues to disregard the bull's attacks. Then he wakes up in the middle of the night. It's Grendel's first time seeing people. It takes Grendel by surprise when he finds out they understand him. He initially appears to be a fungus growing on the oak tree, which the humans initially believe. When they hear him attempt to speak, they immediately believe he is a tree deity. It is thought that because he is hungry, he has to be fed as much as a pig. People believe Grendel is an angry god and begin plotting his murder when he laughs at the concept. It is nearly too late for Grendel to realize that the humans are rational beings. His mother appears just as they are ready to execute him. Grendel tries to explain his observations to his mother after waking up in her cave. His explanation of the nature of existence fails to elicit a response from her. In an attempt to make her understand, he grows increasingly agitated. When all else fails, his mother rushes to her son's side and embraces him tightly. He appears scared to the point of sickness, in her opinion. Despite the fact that she's engulfing him, he doesn't notice it. Men's growth and development are the focus of Chapter 3. First, the tribes are divided into two separate factions. They battle each other from time to time, then return to their caverns and regale each other with tales of their victories. As the groups grow in size, they begin to coalesce. Large communal rooms are built so that they can gather and share stories. They use tapestries and paintings to adorn the hall's interior. Some of the animals are tamed and used for food by humans. While the men go hunting, the ladies tend the camp and the young. They gather in the meat halls at night. Heavily inebriated, the men regale each other with stories about past wars and their plans for the future. Grendel notices that a mead hall has been demolished one day, to his horror. During the era of battle, Grendel detects a shift in the human population. Their music and storylines devolve over time. Soon, they'll be able to manufacture some truly magnificent weaponry. From the shelter of his tree, Grendel is horrified by the endless warfare. As a result of their shared language, Grendel concludes that he must be related to the human beings, as well. This does not sit well with him because of how wasteful humans can be. Grendel's attention is drawn to King Krothgar. He is quickly becoming a formidable force. Krothgar is well organized and quickly gains the support of neighboring tribes. Roads have been constructed that connect all of the tribes, with his own mead hall in the middle. More and more people are forced to sleep outside as the mead hall filled with treasures and the Krothgar bounty expands. Grendel's rage grows as Krothgar's influence extends. There is a bard in the mead room. He tells the stories of the Danes' history through the eyes of their men. Because Grendel was present, he is aware of the fabrications. Even Grendel, however, is unable to shake the impression that the bard is telling the truth since he is so compelling when telling his tale. Inspired by the tales, Grendel runs to the ledge's edge and bellows. He hears his voice coming back to him in a rush. When he returns to his underground home, he does it on all fours. Krothgar was so taken by the bard's tales that he set out to construct a communal mead hall in his honor. Giving out items from his new mead hall is one of his strategies for gaining popularity and admiration from the general public. Krothgar enlists the services of the best craftsmen and painters to create a magnificent mead hall. All the tribes are invited to view it, which he calls Hart. Grendel keeps a close eye on Hart's residents. He can tell that they all have a positive impression of Krothgar. This further adds to his sense of despondency and evilness. In the middle of the camp, Grendel finds a victim with its throat cut open, and he scoops it up, tracing his footprints through the blood. One of the bard's songs can be heard as Grendel stops at the window the harp's tone became melancholy as it played. It was a tale of two brothers who had a long-standing conflict that divided the planet. Grendel, on the other hand, was the dark side, he claimed. The dreadful people group that the Almighty has damned. Once and for all. Grendel was able to discover the truth about his ancestry. Grendel cries out for help and refers to himself as a friend in his pleas. The men, on the other hand, see a different picture. They don't comprehend a word he says, all they see is a bloodied corpse being carried by a creature who is screaming. They use war axes and poison-tipped spears to expel him from the camp. Despite the fact that Grendel cursed the Danes, he returned to the bard several days later to hear more of his tales. In Grendel's opinion, Religious tales are full of nonsense. However, he is extremely isolated, as there is no one of his own species with whom he can converse. He also has to contend with the fact that he was born to destroy. His mother, Grendel, 
can only whimper and, like him, is unable to form words. Grendel plunges to his death from a cliff. An encounter with a dragon awaits him in the underworld. He knew what was coming. The dragon mocks Grendel's fear. He claims that Grendel's reaction to him is the same as humans' reaction to him. Grendel decides to stop frightening the humans for the sake of it. The dragon laughs as if he's been able to read his thoughts. Why don't you scare them? He claims to know everything because he is more evolved than Grendel and the human beings. According to the dragon, he has the ability to travel across time in both directions. Grendel believes him when he tells him that humans are looking for explanations for things they don't comprehend. Grendel doesn't grasp or agree with all of the philosophical insights that the dragon makes to him. Rather than try to alter the course of time, Grendel should just embrace what is and cease trying to better himself. Dragons advise Grendel to stockpile as many gold bars as possible and then rest. A piece of advice from Dragon to Grendel is to stockpile gold to the hilt. It appears that Grendel's attitude has altered. In spite of not intending to scare the Danes for their own amusement, he believes they are all naive. Now, when he hears the bard's songs, he is filled with disgust rather than humiliation. A guard tries to knife him as he is listening to the lecture. Despite the attack by the rest of the Danes, Grendel realizes he is impervious to their attacks. He comes to the conclusion that the dragon has a protective enchantment on him. To make matters worse, he drags a guard along for the ride and proceeds to eat the guard's head off in joy. The twelve-year conflict between Grendel and the Danes begins a few nights later. Grendel enjoys the raids for a while, but he soon finds himself feeling more isolated than ever before. These days, all he hears about in the Mead Hall is people bragging about their victories over him. Angry, he starts destroying the Mead Hall from within. Unfair, a thane, begins to challenge Grendel's lyrical prowess. At first, no one expects Grendel to speak fluent German. He is snarky and mocks Unferth's lack of respect for him. Unferth breaks down in tears as a result of Grendel's taunting, and he departs disgusted but satisfied. Awakened in his lair, Grendel sees that Unferth has followed him. In order to prove that he is brave, Unferth challenges him. It doesn't occur to Grendel that his bravery will not be remembered if the king doesn't return. Unferth boasts that one of them will die that night but Grendel swears him he will bring him back to the hall unharmed. Grendel takes Unferth back to the hall when he falls asleep and taunts him for the next twelve years by not killing him during his raids. Krothgar's numbers have been decimated by raids during the last two years. The might of other tribes is beginning to grow. Krothgar collects his allies and marches to Helming, where Heigmod is king, in retribution. Heigmod offers gold as payment for his surrender when he meets Krothgar's army. In the end, Krothgar declines the offer. Finally, Heigmod presents Wealthy off with his sister. Grendel is moved to tears by her presence in the same way that the bard's melodies had touched him before. Grendel ceases attacking when Krothgar is home since he has taken her as his bride. Krothgar's men appear to have softened under the influence of Wealthy Ow. It is at this point that the bard begins to sing about love and tenderness. Grendel has come to the hall only to observe her soothing presence. A long winter brings Heigmod to the hall and his sister's effect on men as well as adoration from her husband. He cynically interprets it as a sign of frailty. Grendel finally enters the Mead Hall and attacks it. He tries to break Wealthy Ow's control over his aggressive instincts by grabbing her. However, he lets her leave and heads back to his house. The only thing that brings him joy is the fact that he has shattered a widely held belief in Denmark. As the years pass, Krothgar loses his sibling. Rothulf, his nephew, is taken in by him. Because of his moody demeanor, However, the youngster frequently delivers lectures to the villagers, inciting a rebellion. Krothgar and his wife are aware that Rothulf will one day grow to despise them, despite the fact that the boy is friendly to their children. There are numerous challenges to Krothgar's dominion while he dines in his mead hall. Heigmod and Rothulf are there, as is his wife, who is a lot younger than he is. Besides the threat of a neighboring ruler, Krothgar is also concerned about Angeld, whom he intends to marry his eldest daughter as well. That's what he believes will lead to an alliance. For Krothgar, the greatest danger is his nephew's rebellion among the citizens of town. In the Beowulf saga, he does take Krothgar's realm. A god that looks like Grendel is worshipped by the priests, and Grendel soon discovers this. They pray to the destroyer, their god, for assistance in eliminating Grendel. He returns to the ring of statues one night and discovers an elderly blind priest there. Convincing the man of his identity as the destroyer becomes his goal in this encounter. Despite the fact that Grendel intends to murder the priest, he engages in a theological discussion with him. 
As soon as three more priests approach the elderly man, Grendel scurries away. Grendel attends the funeral of the bard. Grendel's mother becomes increasingly irrational as she tries to keep him confined to the cave. The end is near, and she knows it. Grendel, too, has a premonition of doom. The ship carrying the threat to Grendel has arrived. A hulking figure leading a savage band of fifteen soldiers. A Geet of King Hygelic's dynasty, according to him. Beowulf, despite the fact that he is not named, the reader is aware of this. Grendel is looking forward to the day when his boredom will be over. Beowulf is facing some opposition in heart. The thought of enlisting the assistance of a Geet is frowned upon by the men. Unferth tries to jeer Beowulf, but he gets the wrath of the mighty warrior in return. Grendel thinks Beowulf is nuts when he hears Beowulf claim that Unferth is doomed for damnation since he slaughtered his siblings. In a room full of strangers, why would someone say something like that? During the night, Grendel bursts into the meat hall and assaults. Grendel is astonished to encounter Beowulf, who bends his arm, causing him to suffer the first pain he has felt in a long period of time. Beowulf speaks in Grendel's ear the exact words the dragon used as he puts blood into his mouth. It's hard to believe that Beowulf can take Grendel's arm off. Grendel flees the fight. He rushes to his mother's side and tells her about the incident. Afterwards, he plunges to his death into the deepest chasm of all. Poor Grendel, I murmur. So may you all, I mumble back. Grendel, Grendel is the narrator of the story. A bear's size would describe him. His transformation into a mindful being is the story's opening act. He discovers people when he leaves his home in the underworld and ventures forth into the world. Despite their disparities, Grendel takes note of them. As a result of his observations, he begins to form philosophical opinions. Despite the fact that he could understand their language, the few times he attempted to communicate with them were unsuccessful. Grendel becomes practically impervious to pain and able to talk in the language of the Danes after finding a sentient dragon. At this point in his life, though, he regards them as nothing more than animals, and he has a contempt for them. Attacks are made when the weather warms up as part of his 12-year campaign. After these raids, he continues to devour people, despite the fact that it irritates his stomach. Grendel is longing for company, and he welcomes Beowulf when he arrives to slay him. Still, he is taken aback when Beowulf pierces his heart. Krothgar, the king of the Danes, he is called. He is one of Denmark's more learned citizens. With him at the helm, he strives to bring the disparate tribes together. Despite his outspoken views on the unfairness of the social divide, he understands that his nephew is a threat and takes a realistic approach. He also recognizes the flaws in his love for his genteel wife, who he regards as a weakness. Wealthyau, the wife of Krothgar and queen of the Danes. She was delivered to Krothgar as a bride when her brother's kingdom was invaded by Krothgar and his troops. She is generous and kind-hearted. When she enters the room, there is a sense of calm and tranquility. Whenever things get out of hand in the mead hall, she is summoned. The Dane's rage is subdued by her mere presence. Unfair, a Dane who aspires to be a heroic figure. His notions of what constitutes a hero are wildly exaggerated. As a result, when he attempts to engage Grendel in combat, Grendel, on the other hand, mocks him and points out his inherent cowardice. He spends the rest of his life attempting to reclaim his pride by defeating Grendel in order to regain his honor. Rothulf, Krothgar's nephew. Rothulf was raised by his uncle when his father died. Trying to stir the workers, he promotes turmoil throughout the company. A common theme in his speeches is that the rich are unfairly benefiting from their fellow man's labor. Aristocracy appears to be on the verge of disappearing, but the reader is already familiar with Beowulf's story of how he takes his uncle's crown and becomes ruler. Although Rothulf is sympathetic to the small children and Krothgar's wife, Krothgar understands that he will one day pose a threat to them. Hygmud, King of the Helmings. When Krothgar attacks his realm, wealthy Al's brother offers her in marriage to him. Krothgar understands that his brother-in-law is devising ways to gain power at his expense, despite the peace agreement. The more power he can gather, the better off he will be. Biography of John Chaplin Gardner. Grendel's author, John Chaplin Gardner Jr was born on this date in 1933 in Batavia, New York, USA. His parents were farmers and teachers, respectively. Both of his parents were Shakespeare fans, and they would often repeat lines from the play. Gardner was an active Boy Scout when he was a kid. He earned the rank of Eagle Scout. When Gardner wasn't at school, he helped out on the family farm. A multi-packer, or huge rake-like implement, was being used by Gardner in 1945 to prepare land for tilling. 
a tragic accident claimed the life of his younger sibling. Gardner suffered from nightmares and flashbacks for the rest of his life as a result of the event. In his short narrative, Redemption, written in 1977, this catastrophe reappeared frequently. Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, where he received his MA and PhD in 1955, is where Gardner began his academic career. Graduated from the University of Iowa in 1958 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. Scholarly visits to the University of Detroit in Michigan in 1970 and 1971 included Gardner's tenure as distinguished visiting professor. The Sunlight Dialogues is one of Gardner's best-known works. It's his take of the 1960s in the United States. It's a traditional small town with an outlandish cast of personalities. When a drifter spray paints the word love across two lanes of traffic, the sheriff investigates. They discuss morality, freedom, and choice in philosophical debates. After the death of her affluent husband, an elder brother and sister are forced to live together in his Vermont farmhouse. October Light won the National Book Critics Circle Award. Both of my siblings are estranged from one another, he shoots her television with a shotgun. However, when the outside neighbors get involved, they form a group. The novel Grendel is one of his best works. A retelling of Beowulf from a monster's perspective was published in 1971. The monster wonders about the meaning of life and the pain of being alone. As an anti-hero, Grendel longs for redemption but can't find it. John Gardner was a well-known instructor in the field of creative writing. The Art of Fiction and On Becoming a Novelist are two of the most widely used textbooks for writing courses. On Moral Fiction was so controversial that he became a regular on talk shows and in the media for a period. He was ostracized from several publishing houses because he spoke out against the moral ambiguity of classic authors like John Updike and John Bartholomew in his opinion, books should serve as a guide to discovering the universally beneficial and sustaining values. John Gardner died on his motorcycle on September 14, 1982 just four days before his third wedding to Susan Thornton. He had lost control on a bend and crashed. Two miles from his Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, home, he was found dead. In Batavia, New York, he is buried with his brother in Grandview Cemetery. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video.